case, uh, to my understanding, no decision uh, has or will be taken in the in the in the near term regarding the the, the future of the Olympics. Uh, we've said this with regard to all mass gatherings. We need a risk management approach. There is no zero risk in organising any mass gathering at this moment in time. What we need it to do for each gathering. And there are religious gatherings, there are sports gatherings, there are business gatherings all over the world, all of the time. We need to have uh, a clearly <clears throat> risk management approach for those events, and we are providing advice on that. We have an internal task force. We have a lot of experience in supporting mass gatherings before in the midst of Olympics, like uh, during the Zika outbreak, during the previous <clears throat> SARS outbreak and the Special Olympics, and many others. And uh, if you cast your mind back to those events, many of those events went ahead with appropriate risk management. So we intend to work uh, through the IOC, IOC task force, which they've established with the Tokyo 2020 committee. So no decision on that from our perspective, and we will be offering uh, advice through time. Any deadline or any something that, something that you think that may take some actions or agenda for this decision? No. I mean, no. Just I mean, keep monitoring? I think at this think point everyone is monitoring the situation. I think the, the Tokyo 2020 committee and the Japanese government take the issue very seriously. Uh, so do the IOC. And uh, I think everyone is working together to try and preserve what is a fantastically important global event. And uh, everything will be done uh, to, to make that uh, a successful and, uh, and uh, uh, event for the world. Thank you very much. Uh, please, if we can really uh, agree that uh, every journalist ask one question so we can get as many as possible. Jamil, please, then uh, Bagdia. Jamil, if you can just come, uh, please, and introduce yourself. Yes, uh, Jamil Shadi from uh, Brazil. Mr. Tedros, uh, my question is obviously on the first case in South America. Uh, it is, uh, in, a, in a way, a novelty because of, of the tropical conditions. So what does that mean for the virus? And as you said, you have the uh, country having, or countries uh, having to take uh, decisive measures. But how does that apply when the local uh, health ish, uh, system is already in trouble. Thank you. Um, I can begin. I, I think uh, Brazil <clears throat> has a very uh, strong and proud history of actually dealing with quite serious epidemics. If we look at uh, dengue epidemics in the recent years and, and yellow fever, and has clearly demonstrated the capacity for large-scale response. In fact, Brazil was in the front line of the Zika response as well. So risk management in Brazil and in South America in general, uh, public health uh, has, a, has a proud and, 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 and scientific and evidence-based uh, history. It is disappointing to see uh, South America America and another continent as such exposed to this virus and we are already we were speaking this morning myself and the director general with our regional director in the Americas and uh, uh, we are already providing direct support to the Brazilian authorities uh, in, in this matter with regard to the issue of the the risk associated with the virus uh, I think we need to be careful on making assumptions about whether a virus will spread or not because of climatic or other conditions but maybe uh, Maria can add to that yeah, so just to say, the approach doesn't change. The approach is exactly the same as if it were to show up in Brazil or if it were to show up in any other country. Um, just as the Director General said is, are you ready? Are you ready to take care of that case, um, to isolate that case, to provide um, uh, clinical care to that case? Are you ready to identify all of the contacts that are associated with that case? And there is a real opportunity here. I don't think we can stress that enough that in all of these countries that are identifying cases for the first time, it is within your control to be able to, to stop this and, and to do what you can to limit any onward transmission in those countries. So regardless of where this, this virus shows up, the approach is the same. Thank you very much, uh, Maria, please. Then we will go online. If you can just press the button on one of these uh, mics, yes, and get closer. Thank, get you. Closer. Thank you. Just, just press just it, please. Press Thank it, please. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Diadiashin from Iran International TV. It is regarding uh, Iran. Iranian health ministry says that uh, the death toll has reached to 26, but the confirmed cases of, of COVID-19 patients are about 240. Five. It means, unfortunately, in my home country, more than uh, one out of ten uh, is dying uh, uh, by the, when they contaminate the virus. But uh, the worldwide rate outside China is about two percent. How WHO explains this? It's now it's five times bigger than the worldwide rate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are a number of factors that could explain that. The most likely factor is that 
obviously um, <clears throat> this disease came unseen and undetected into Iran, so the, the extent of infection may be broader than what we may be seeing, as is the case mm -hmm. in many epidemics when they start, is you only see the severe end of the spectrum, and then as you do more surveillance, you find more mild cases. Uh, again, uh, Iran has dealt with many emergencies in the past, and in fact, uh, Iran's history of earthquake and disaster response and emergency medical team shows there's a very high clinical capacity for managing severely ill patients in Iran. So I don't suspect this has anything to do with clinical care. I suspect this is more to do with surveillance and detection uh, of cases at this point. And we, we would expect, as surveillance steps up in Iran, that more cases are uh, identified that are in the milder range. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, hi. Uh, so, U.S. has already confirmed one case of community transmission. Uh, so, if you could just tell us if there are more countries which are having cases of community transmission, and which are those countries? And how many countries are actually now also having human-to-human -human transmission? Uh, also, uh, Dr. Bruce has submitted your report to you, uh, I think, a couple of days ago. He has also held a press conference. Can that report be shared with us, the journalists? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we, the, the report, as reported by the international expert group, will be posted, uh, I think, later today. That's the information uh, I have. And for the rest, maybe? Yeah. Um, again, uh, there are many scenarios underway in the world. Uh, I, I, I didn't hear the country you mentioned first. U.S. Yeah. US, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think we need to separate here, and I think you talked about human-to-human -human transmission and community transmission. Let, let's, let's go back to what the Director General said countries that have their first cases, their first importations, and then countries that have clusters of disease, and then countries that have evidence of community transmission but not extensive and beyond. The, 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 uh, the vast majority of countries that have actually imported cases are in, still in the importation mm -hmm. phase. Uh, some countries have uh, localized clusters of cases. Singapore will be a good example where you have well-identified clusters of disease that are well traced mm -hmm. and being controlled through uh, public health means. And then there are other countries like uh, Korea and Japan where there is mainly clusters of disease but there's some evidence of transmission at a community level and a lot of hard work is going on to try and identify uh, exactly how those clusters are linked. Uh, the questions then in the likes of Italy and the Iran are as to how much of that transmission is clustered and how much of that transmission is at community level. But in terms of sustained, efficient transmission at community level, uh, we don't see uh, evidence of, of that yet uh, in terms of the number of generations of spread. Mm -hmm. uh, in places like, for example, in, in Japan, we're seeing second and third generation spread. We're not seeing extensive community transmission at this point. Uh, it, it's difficult to explain this in a, in a verbal response. Mm -hmm. What I suggest we do is maybe uh, put together data on that uh, and maybe release that as part of our situation report uh, with a more detailed explanation around those categories, if that would help. Thank you very much. Uh, next uh, question comes from Rwanda. Christopher from uh, nonaha.com. Uh, Christopher, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I will, uh, you, the Director General said that uh, uh, around 800 health, health professionals have been uh, trained. I want to know how many of them are from uh, sub saharan Africa, the world, even developed countries, fears the virus. I think uh, it's very hard, it's not to do very hard if the virus comes to sub saharan Africa. How ready is the world, the WHO, to help what the assets or, or the budget, how much is ready to help uh, sub saharan Africa in the preparedness of uh, the virus, against the virus? And the last three, I want to know, uh, is on the, on the side of uh, uh, research, what's being done to, to, to get uh, the vaccine or rather a medical treatment uh, against uh, the virus? Thank you. Where is this from? From Rwanda. Okay. 
Amakuru. Amakuru ni mezaliche. Murakoze chane. Thank you. Thank you. Murakoze. Murakoze chane. So, um, from the start, WHO already expressed its greatest concern uh, would be actually uh, our continent, Africa, my continent. Um, because most of the countries have weaker health systems. And from the start, we have decided to invest as much as possible so um, you know, countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, can get ready. And we started from improving the diagnostics capa capability, and that has uh, improved significantly. As you know, almost uh, all countries except a couple have been sending samples to other uh, areas or elsewhere uh, to have the result uh, for coronavirus infection. And now uh, more than 40 countries have the capability in country to uh, test for coronavirus. But in addition to that, um, we want uh, the African continent to respond to this outbreak in a coordinated fashion. And that's why last Friday we had a meeting organized by the African Union, Africa CDC, and uh, WHO. Um, a meeting of the ministers of uh, Africa, the whole uh, continent, to agree on continent-wide response or continent-wide preparedness and also uh, national uh, level uh, preparedness and, 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 and response. And that was a very productive uh, meeting, and I had the opportunity to, to, to attend. And from that meeting, we were able to understand the gaps they have, and we will uh, continue to support um, so that the preparedness is, is, is better and something that hopefully can address the gaps they have and minimize the concern that, that we have. And then with training, out of the 80,000, most of uh, the trainees are from uh, Africa. Uh, but we don't believe that 80,000 is enough, so we will continue to train more and uh, move aggressively, especially in uh, preparing the uh, health workers in all, in all uh, countries. And for the rest, maybe <coughs> Mike? Yeah, we're um, and not just in Africa, but, but in all countries that have vulnerable health systems, we're, we're working quite fast now in terms of 85 countries receiving uh, vital PPE supplies uh, from, from WHO, um, and that will continue to roll out, as well as the, the training for health workers. In fact, our, our head of clinical interventions is actually in Africa today, uh, presiding over a specialist training for intensive care for respiratory disease patients in a multi-country training exercise. Next week, there will be two simultaneous meetings at our sub-regional platforms in Nairobi and Senegal to further extend the, uh, those training uh, in initiatives But uh, in, in, in Africa. But again, Africa is very used to dealing with epidemics. I've said this before. Uh, the, there is a great deal of resilience in Africa and a great deal of coping capacity. Uh, and uh, what we need to do is give the resources and the training and the extra help that those systems need. But uh, Africa is dealing with uh, so many outbreaks all of the time uh, that that's the difficulty is many African countries have to deal with more than one epidemic, be it measles or monkeypox or cholera or Ebola. And this places extra strain on the health systems. But these aren't the only countries that are vulnerable. There are vulnerable populations in every country. Uh, so the idea of a vulnerable country versus the idea of a vulnerable community. Every nation on the planet has vulnerable communities. Older people, people with underlying medical conditions. So we also need to move to build capacity to treat and save lives everywhere, not just uh, in one part of the world. Just, just to add to that, another way in which we're bringing healthcare workers in, into the fold and learning about this is through our, through conversations, through bringing them together through teleconferences and sharing experiences. Uh, I've just come back from from two weeks in China, and the experience that the healthcare workers have there and what they're learning needs to be shared with the world. So bringing that together through virtual means, either through teleconferences or through trainings or through, is something that that is being done. It has been done since the beginning of this epidemic, um, but it will continue to happen. So as we 
we learn more as they learn more, we're sharing those experiences with each other so that we can protect them, protect ourselves, and, and provide the best treatment that we can to anyone that's infected. Dr. Van Kierkegaard, we'll take uh, one more uh, from online. Uh, Julia Belouz from Vox. Can you hear us, Julia? Julia. Hello, Julia. Hello, do you, do you, can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear us? Yep. Thank you so much. Please, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Thank you. Can you comment at all on how the diagnostic criteria in countries should change, given that we're, we're learning so much more about people presenting with, you know, you mentioned that it's 90% fever as a first symptom, but there's also evidence of gastrointestinal systems, sorry, gastrointestinal symptoms. And where we've also know that um, countries don't, as you've been talking about, don't always have access to testing, including the US. So is there a sense of how diagnostic criteria should evolve, and especially in contexts where the diagnostics might not be available? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Your question. And we got it, although the line wasn't the best. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, 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 yes, and during any epidemic, as we learn more about a virus and its impact, we do evolve diagnostic criteria and case definitions. And uh, later on today, WHO will issue updated uh, surveillance uh, uh, guidance and uh, case definitions based on, on what we've uh, learned uh, so far. Uh, the best way to make a definitive diagnosis of uh, COVID-19 is still uh, a, a validated laboratory test. There are many other conditions that be, can, can be confused uh, with uh, with uh, COVID-19, especially when uh, you've only got one or two cases amongst what might be background flu and other atypical pneumonias. In the middle of a very large outbreak, yes, an X-ray or a CT scan can be predictive of the disease. So the diagnostic criteria depend on what proportion of your overall pneumonias are being caused by a specific disease. I know it's a very technical term, so the best way of making this diagnosis is still with the valid data test in the laboratory uh, and all countries almost all countries in the world now have that capacity and to, to remind you of what the, the DG said uh, two weeks ago only two countries in Africa had the capacity to make the diagnosis uh, that was uh, Senegal IP and NICD in South Africa uh, as of today almost every country has that capacity both in terms of training and in terms of uh, laboratory capacity in fact the one or two countries in which there are issues are less to do with uh, anything other than uh, transport customs and other issues there are technical or logistics issues uh, that have prevented those countries uh, bringing their testing online but that will be solved in the in the coming days so uh, yes the diagnostic criteria will shift and, and change over time and will depend on the local context Text. But in, in some, can, can you hear me? Yes, but very shortly, very Julia, shortly Julia, go ahead. Julia, please go ahead. In, in some cases, obviously, like like in the U.S. right now, the, the tests have to be shipped to state labs, and there's a delay. And so, so yeah, we're, yeah, seeing, we're this seeing this possibility in examples, examples where, where it can take some time to, di to diagnose the, the person. person. So, so what should health professionionals professional do in those cases? cases? Yeah, I, 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 I think it's very difficult to, concert, to, to, to make a comment on any individual country's arrangements. But in the context of very low incidence or just importations of disease or localized clusters, the, the issue is getting tests done at a, at a properly validated, high-quality lab. Uh, if proper precautions are taken with suspect cases in the meantime, you can wait 24 hours for the result. It's better to have a validated result from a good lab uh, than trying to, to guess work on this. So what really is important that when a suspect case is detected, that that person is appropriately isolated, that you begin the public health measures like contact tracing, and then you adjust those measures based on the outcome of the test. We shouldn't be waiting for the result of the test to begin taking the basic public health measures uh, in that sense. Uh, and yes, I think many large countries are now moving their testing down to state level, and many of those are trying to move their testing down to the county or the next administrative level. And the ideal situation would obviously be to have testing available at sub-national level, uh, especially in, in larger countries. Thank you very much. We'll go back to the room. Uh, first, Shoko, then Jamie, and then our guest here for the first time here. Shoko, please. Yes. Hello. Uh, this is Shoko Koyama from NHK, Japanese Public TV. Uh, Dr. Tedros, you just mentioned that there were 
now more new cases uh, reported from countries outside chi outside of China than from China, and you just said it's a decisive point. But what what does it mean exactly? What what do you mean by that decisive point? Thank you. Um, when I say decisive uh, point, uh, one uh, there is a positive side, uh, meaning you can see signal that when you do. A containment measure like China is doing, you can uh, actually see a decline in the cases and ultimately it can be contained. Uh, while on the other side, the increase in the rest of the world, we will see more, more cases, is a bad news. And especially uh, in three countries, we are saying class, we're seeing clusters in Iran, in uh, Italy, and also in, in, in Korea. And I was putting some four scenarios in my speech. The first one is single case, second is cluster, third is some co start of some community transmission, and then the fourth is sustained and intensive uh, community transmission. So the decisive point then is we're seeing the third phase, which is clustering of cases in three, uh, countries. And I even said, if you take Italy, a member of the G7, uh, it was really surprised. So even many other developed countries should also see some surprises, should expect some surprises. So that's why I say decisive. On one hand, there is a positive signal. On the other hand, there is a reason for, for, for concern. Um, then the two combined, it shows you that we are actually in a very delicate situation where the outbreak can go in any direction based on how we handle it. Mm -hmm. But still the message is how are we handling it and how are we going to handle it? Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, it signals that um, everything, I mean the outcome will depend on how we, we, we handle it and that's why it's decisive. It's how we handle it but we see something negative and something positive. It shows that it can be contained, but if we don't do the right things, it can get out, it can get out of control too. Mm -hmm. So let's use the, this very, this narrowing window of opportunity, I said it many times, it's getting even more narrow. Let's use this window of opportunity to mobilize all things. We should do everything, starting from containment to preparedness for any eventualities, even worst uh, scenario, and give it our, our, our best. And that's why I outlined, with more than 12 questions actually, mm -hmm. that a minister should ask from the first case. And the last question is about whether the community is with us or not, or whether yeah. the citizens of a certain country are actually well aware and uh, supporting. So this question should be answered properly because we're in a decisive uh, point. So decisive because whether we get it wrong or right, it's in our hands. Mm -hmm. That's it. Because we saw both sides. When we handle it well, we see positive result. Even I read eight countries. When we don't handle it right, then we saw what the consequences are in some countries. Yeah. Thank you very much. We have nine minutes, so we will try to a squeeze, very short questions, Jamie first, and then uh, Ms. Uh, Yeli. Can you hear me? It's Jamie over here. Yes, back. please. Um, quick question. Um, Dr. Tedros, you've been talking about preparedness as being the main thing, and I want to really hit hard on that um, point. A couple of very quick questions that are all similar, they're all together. Um, how much does the COVID test cost? Um, how much is that going to cost countries? Second of all, how concerned are you that masks may be in shortage? Um, particularly in Europe. And then third of all, President Trump said that people should be treating this like the flu virus in some ways in terms of the way they behave. Is that overly simple? And then, very, Mike, you mentioned case definitions changes. You've got the cameras rolling now. Can you tell us what those ca case definition changes are going to be? Thank you. So for, for next press conferences, no questions for you. 
no, no, okay. No, by the way, it's okay to give him a chance. He's uh, he's the cameraman he's as well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we can uh, the uh, the COVID test cost. Uh, there's a different range of prices. There are different manufacturers. Uh, and uh, but the tests that, that we have have sourced, uh, uh, I, I cost less than uh, five dollars each. But there are there's a, a wide range of uh, testing platforms available, so I won't go into what others cost. There is a shortage of supply of masks, but let's separate the issue of the surgical masks that people want to wear on the street. Uh, from what are N95 or FFP2 or 3 respirator masks which are needed within clinical care environments. We've been trying to protect those supplies. That's what we've been trying to do. The Director General has written previously to all the manufacturers. He's written to all the producing countries. He's asked for people to show that solidarity, not just at country level, but at the private sector level. We've asked for national strategic stockpiles to, uh, to, uh, to allow some of that those reserves in, in countries with larger economies who have strategic reserves to be able to provide uh, PPE and, 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 and masks to other countries that may not have them. We have a global supply center in, du, uh, in, in, in UAE and in Dubai, our global logistics center, and we've supplied those 85 countries from there. We continue to try and resupply that, but there are significant strains in that system. Uh, there's also the pandemic supply chain network, which we operate jointly with the World Economic Forum, and we've had a, a large number of public of private sector organizations, both manufacturers, distributors, transport companies, working within that uh, network for the last eight weeks on regular calls, trying to, uh, we've also done a detailed market analysis, and we've looked at where the pressure points are in the system, particularly for uh, respirators, uh, respirator masks, or the higher level masks. And uh, we also, within the UN system, as part of the UN crisis management team have uh, established a, a UN supply chain coordination cell between WHO, UNICEF and uh, the World Food, uh, Food Programme. Um, and uh, with regard to the case definitions, um, let, let's let them come out, Jamie. We, we could be here for two hours as I explain to you the nuances of case definitions. I'm not sure the, 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 the public might be too interested in the detail of that, but we can take it offline. Uh, I'll leave the, the chief to answer that. Uh, by the way, on that, uh, if, if I am asked to advise the communities to prevent uh, this virus, I would give them the same advice as what you give to, to flu. Wash your hands with water and soap, and also don't rub your uh, face, and also six feet distance or so. Um, I think with that regard, especially absence of uh, vaccines and, and so on, and people, you know, taking care of themselves, it's the same. If you see it scientifically, uh, you can say it's not flu. But there are many things that is in common, and you can prevent it using the basic things we use to prevent flu. So the president is right to say that. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Uh, Lee. Thank you for taking my question. Lee from Xinhua News Agency. Uh, my question is actually a development from the uh, previous one concerning the mask. We know that the mask could, could help prevent transmission from coughing and sneezing, and people all around China are called on to wear masks from the beginning of the outbreak. But as the virus develops in Europe, it seems people still tend to think that those who are only those who are sick need to uh, wear a mask. So, what is the comment and suggestion from WHO concerning the stigmatization of wearing masks? Thank you. So I, I can answer that question. So um, you're right. There, is, there are a lot of people out there that have questions about the use of masks, particularly in the community. And we're talking about medical masks here, so um, not the N95 masks. Um, the WHO guidance is that we recommend people to wear masks if they themselves are sick, if they themselves have respiratory 
uh, signs and symptoms. And the reason for that is for them to prevent the transmission to someone else, not to protect themselves from getting infected. So it, it can be confusing, um, but we try to make it very clear um, that you use a mask when you are, yourself are sick uh, and that we're talking about a surgical mask. Now what's also important is how you wear that mask. We have some very good videos that are online that will show you how to actually put it on and take it off and how you dispose of it properly so that you don't actually increase your risk of infection. I had to wear a mask for a few weeks in, in China and I actually touched my face a lot more than I would have had I not had a mask on. I was following national guidance um, for when I was in China. Um, so you just have to make sure that you put it on properly, you take it off properly. Um, it's very important that we, if we have shortages of masks, that we, that we use them for the frontline workers and that we prioritize the use of those masks for the people who really need it in hospital, but also for those who are taking care of people at home. So you need to come up? Yes. Okay. Uh, but in, some experts say that people in their incubation period, they can be infectious. So people are worried that I might be uh, affected when this one does not know he has been already been affected. So what's the risk down? Thank you. Um, could, uh, again, we, we need to be careful here. The, the data from China and other places does not suggest that asymptomatic people are the driving force behind this epidemic, right? And I think this is becoming a, a sort of a myth in this. It, it's not to suggest that scientifically someone cannot be infectious before they're sick. That could happen. But the vast majority of transmission in this epidemic is occurring from symptomatic individuals to other individuals. That, that, it's important to get that. And none of the data from the extensive studies in China have shown that asymptomatic individuals have been driving this epidemic. So that's important to reassure people. I'm not saying it can't happen, but it's not the major factor in this epidemic. Uh, second uh, thing is, uh, uh, I think Maria spoke about hands to face. Uh, I've been looking around the room here. I can't tell you the number of you who've put your hands to your face in the last uh, 20 minutes or half an hour. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I, I think we need to be also we don't want to tell people what not to do. People take action to protect their health, and we're not going to criticize them for trying to protect their health. What we try to do is tell people how to do it properly, and then what else you need to do. Mm -hmm. And if I have to make a choice, I will keep my hands clean. I will use hand sanitizer. I'll wash my hands with soap and water. I'll cough into my sleeve. I will ensure that I, you know, when I touch surfaces, that I wash my hands after. Uh, uh, they're the actions that will prevent the transmission of disease as well. So WHO doesn't want to tell people what not to do. We want to tell people what to do, and we have lots of guidance out there on what to do. So let's focus, let's focus on that. There's also a cultural dimension here. Historically, uh, um, population and communities in Asia have used masks for pollution purposes in cities and others. So it's become a cultural norm as well. So we have to take that into account, what's acceptable or not in a cultural context. So that's why we're very sensitive about saying no to people. It's about showing people how to, if you're going to wear a mask, wear it properly. Last 60 seconds for John, and I'm sorry to Bloomberg, really, we will have another opportunity. I, I had like five queries like from Bloomberg, Bloomberg, Bloomberg people Bloomberg today be answering. John, please, last question. Yes, no, a little bit further down. Yes. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon, John Zarakostas, this is the for in the Lancet. Uh, Director General, you've mentioned about the need for preparedness. From the WHO perspective and the six regional offices that you have, how many member states are prepared at the moment? You've got to be doing a stop take in real time. And secondly, we're hearing concerns about shortages of conventional drugs because of this crisis. Some on the essential drug list of the WHO. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can take the second part of that question, John. There have been issues on supply chains, particularly for active pharmaceutical ingredients, uh, because many of those are produced in China and they're on the critical pathway for producing uh, many essential drugs around the world. But many of those industries are now switching back on again and we're beginning to see the, the pressure in that system beginning to ease. Uh, Maria Angela Simao and her team here who work on essential health technologies are monitoring that on a daily basis and ensuring that uh, we're doing all possible to ensure that those systems switch back on and efficiently deliver active pharmaceutical ingredients uh, as needed into the system. 
uh, uh, on that point. Uh, your first point was on? The first one was how many members of the state, member state yeah. are, yeah. are prepared. Not from your regional offices, you've got to be monitoring this in real time. The, uh, I would point you to the, 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 the analysis that's done on self-reporting for IHR and the capacities, the joint external evaluations, the after-action reviews that are done for each country. If you look at it, most countries now have national action plans for public health security. Most of those national action plans have very great detail on the preparedness in any number of 14 different pillars of public health preparedness. They're existing documents that exist for most countries. Uh, other countries have specific plans for uh, respiratory disease or influenza preparedness uh, usually. Uh, when we did our analysis, we looked at risk and vulnerability analysis at the same time. Risk of importation uh, and also vulnerability to spread once the disease had arrived. We've categorized those countries into different groups and that's what we've been using to prioritize the supply chain, what we've been using to prioritize the national action planning. Uh, and I won't give you those lists of countries, but we would uh, uh, consider that there are probably in the region of 30 to 40 countries who really have a high level of risk and a high level of vulnerability when it comes to this virus, and we're working very closely with them, but with all countries. But again, as the Director General said, there are four different scenarios that you have to deal with. Each country then has different level of risk and vulnerability to those four scenarios. So it's a complex matrix, uh, but we continue to focus on those countries with the highest level of vulnerability. Thank you very much. We will conclude with this as our guests uh, have to leave. Uh, uh, please um, be aware that we will send uh, the audio file immediately now and the transcript as always will be posted tomorrow. For any additional questions, don't hesitate to contact media team. Have a nice evening.